All right, we're going to get started. Um, so first, I just wanted to welcome everyone to this um, keynote speech with Bonnie Christine. And this is a part of our Surface Design Symposium, which is being co-presented by Craft Industry Alliance and Spoonflower. This is the first year we've done this event, and we are just so excited that you are here to join us today. I'm Abby Glassenberg. I'm the co-founder and president of Craft Industry Alliance, and welcome. Um, this session is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it afterward if you need to. And just by note of housekeeping, um, we do want to hear your questions for Bonnie. Please put them in the chat box as we go. I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll leave about maybe eight to 10 minutes or so at the end. We'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie Christine. Bonnie? Abby, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I um, have been looking forward to this for so long and I'm so excited to see some familiar names as well as some new names as well. And I'm so excited to talk to you all today. Um, I, you have, if you've been joining the symposium so far, you have been taken care of so well. You already have so much of the technical information that you have, you know what surface pattern design is, you know how to create a repeating pattern and you know about licensing. And so in my session today, we're gonna really kind of take like a bird's eye view of the process and what it takes to really get there, uh, what it takes to really get there. So um, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna try to keep an eye on the chat and um, let me pull up my slide deck. Okay, um, let me know. Give me a woo -hoo. give me a woohoo. Okay. Yeah, all set. <laughs> awesome. See, you didn't really disappear. You're like a your voice. <laughs> okay. We're gonna talk about what it takes to move from that dreaming phase to the doing phase. By the time that we're done with this workshop, I, you, I, my overarching goal is for you to feel inspired, so deeply inspired, but more so than that, have clarity on exactly the next steps that you can take in order to make tremendous progress on your goal. So we're gonna talk about goal setting and achieving. We're gonna talk about a roadmap to becoming a successful surface pattern designer. We're gonna to touch on how to develop your signature style and create cohesive pattern collections. And <laughs> if I can get through everything, we're gonna have time for Q and A. So, Without further ado, let's uh, jump in. I do have something for you. If you can see my picture, I have a free guide and I'm gonna be referencing several pages in this today. And this uh, is a free guide that's also PDF format. Abby, I don't know if you could pop that um, link into the chat, but it's surfacepatterndesigners.com forward slash guide. And so I'll be referencing um, several pages in this if you wanna uh, go grab it and you can follow along workbook style with me. Again, that's surfacepatterndesigners.com forward slash guide. You can grab yours and follow along with what we're gonna talk about. So you all know, because you're here, what exactly surface pattern design is. It is the work of creating artwork for products like fabric, wallpaper, gift wrap, and so many new things. I hope that your mind is just spinning with all of the possibilities after the other um, uh, workshops today. But I wanna talk about why we love surface pattern design so much. And for me, surface design really means, um, first and foremost, doing something that I love doing something that's so fulfilling, so creative, and something that I truly never feel like is work. Um, you know, it's work and it's a job and it never feels like it because it's so much fun. Furthermore, it really contains three freedoms that has completely changed my life and thousands of other surface designers as well. Number one is location freedom. As a surface pattern designer, you can work from anywhere in the world. And so for some of you, this means maybe you get to work, you know, at the beach or on vacation or somewhere exotic. 
Some of you, it means being able to work with your young children at home alongside of you. That was my first and foremost goal. And then for me, it actually allowed me to move back to my teeny tiny town in the mountains of North Carolina, where there aren't a lot of jobs, but there is internet. <laughs> so we wanted to live here because my parents and my husband's parents both live here. And we thought if there was any way that we could also raise our children here with both sets of grandparents that that we wanted to do that. And working as a surface designer means that you can do any of that. You can work anywhere from in the world. Number two is time freedom. And I think that this is really gonna resonate with so many of you. As creatives, we don't always feel most creative from nine to five. Am I right? Does that resonate with anyone? <laughs> Some of you are night owls and you feel your energy really come to life you know, at midnight and onwards. Some of you are early birds and you feel most creative at four or 5 a.m. in the morning. Some of you just know that you have a flow to your energy and your ability to focus. And so when you're a creative entrepreneur, you get to absolutely set your own hours. Yeah, so tell me if you're a night owl or an early bird in the chat, um, or maybe neither. <laughs> But the most important thing is that you're in charge of your time and you may still be working 40 hours a week, but you get to choose what hours of the day and what days of the week that is. Finally, we love surface design because of the financial freedom. So we're not gonna talk about this too much today, but it, what I want you to know is that it is, um, because of licensing, you're able to create income that doesn't have a cap to it. It's called um, passive income and residual income, meaning you do the work once and you get paid for it over and over and over again. And there's really no limit to the success. And so the you've probably learned that in licensing, it can take a little while to get some wind under your wings. But once the ball begins to roll, you're able to uh, really leverage your artwork and license it in multiple industries for multiple years and really grow an incredible business. So I recently um, learned about this book. Uh, Tessie Snow is um, a part of my team and also a surface pattern designer. And she's reading this book called Joyful. And she sent me this picture out of it. And I, I fell in love with it so much because pattern design truly is also so joyful. So I'm going to read this out of this book, Joyful by Ingrid Fatale Lee. Whether sonic or visual, patterns are a timeless source of joy. One of the reasons we love patterns and rhythms is that their structured repetition of elements quickly establishes a base level of harmony. Patterns enable us to experience an abundance of sensation without it feeling overwhelming, and they can create an orderly background against which we can detect when something is out of place or awry. This lets our brain relax rather than having to remain on high alert. This resonates with me so much because we know we love pattern, but I was never really sure how to express why. And if you're a pattern designer and you have created a pattern, you also know how deeply satisfying it is to see that pattern come to life right away and find the repetition and you're, you're, it's, it's addicting. It's so much fun. And so as oftentimes we talk about getting bit by the pattern bug because you start and it's so fulfilling. And I think that this is one reason why. So I truly believe that the things we're passionate about are not random. They are our calling. This is a quote from Fabrienne Fredrickson. And so before we really dive into our content today, I want to share a little bit of my story with you. Some of you know my story, but many of you don't. Many of you probably are only meeting me for the very first time. And I want to tell you my story because I want you to know where I came from what I struggled with and how much of the same things we potentially struggle with. Um, I grew up in love with fabric, in love with art, in love with creativity, in love with crafting, but I wouldn't have called myself an artist. I would have called myself maybe crafty. And so when it was time to go to college, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I did know that I wanted to um, be an entrepreneur. So I went to business school. Um, way back in 2004. 
Um, when I graduated, I married my high school sweetheart, moved back to my hometown, and started working for my mom in her quilt shop. Part of my job there was to meet with reps and look at new fabric collections and decide what we were going to um, have as inventory in the store. And I will never forget the moment that I was walking down an aisle with bolts of fabric on both sides of me, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh my goodness, this is someone's job. Like someone's job is to design fabric. So this was in 2009. And right then, everything felt like it fell into place for me. Right then, everything felt like, like everything I loved just fit into one career. And can you remember when you realized that surface pattern design was even a thing, that it was even a, a, a career option? And so in that moment, I decided that this, I, this was it. I wanted to be a fabric designer. Only problem was that I had no idea <laughs> how to do it, how to get started. I had no presence. Um, no one knew who I was. I wasn't an artist. I didn't know Adobe Illustrator. I just had a big dream. I had a really big dream and a really big goal. I also want to say in 2009, there were no online classes. There was no one teaching this. There was no industry information and everything felt like it was held kind of close to the chest, like industry and industry insights were really hard to come by. And so I, uh, had started sharing my dream. I started talking about it. I told my husband, I told my mom. And um, all of a sudden I woke up one morning and I remember the very morning that it dawned on me that it had been six months since I had decided that this was my goal. I'm gonna come back to you and talk to you straight to face for a minute. Um, it had been six months by the time I had had that goal to where I woke up that morning and I thought I haven't done anything in order to inch myself closer to this dream. And the reason was I was so overwhelmed. The dream and goal was so big and I was so far away from it that it felt too big to even conquer it. I didn't even know how to get started. And so that day, laying in the bed that morning, I decided that I was gonna start doing just one thing every single day that would just get me a little bit closer to accomplishing that dream. And it sounds really simple, but I made a promise to myself and I started doing something that day. And you know what it was? It was Googling how to become a fabric designer. Simply just research because I knew, I, I did not know what I needed to do in two weeks or three months or eight months. That was too overwhelming. My, my sight was too far in ahead of me. And so I brought it right in front of me and I thought, what could I just do today to make a little bit of progress? And so I promised myself that I was gonna do that. Um, fast forward 18 months and I didn't skip one day. Now, some days were five minutes, um, but other days were six, seven, eight hours. And at the end of 18 months, I signed my first contract as a fabric designer in the fall of 2012. Since then, I've gone on to license designs and illustrations and patterns on products all over the world. I have gone on to educate and teach others how to become licensing artists and illustrators as well. And I've built a tremendous business who also now gets to support a team of creatives. And it's one of my biggest honors. So what this did was number one, help me realize that big goals and dreams were possible. Like I said, I had no, <laughs> no idea what I was doing. And if I can do it, you can truly do it. It made me not only believe in me and my big goals and um, my, my uh, ability to accomplish big things, but it also made me believe in you, made me believe in your ability to conquer big goals as well. Okay, let me come back to my, um, to my slide. I had to dig up these photographs from like um, back in 2012. So um, this is my very first portfolio that I took with me to International Quilt Market in 2012, and the one that I got licensed with. 
So we're going to talk about goal setting and achieving because all of this really helped me understand how to work backwards from a big goal and um, really develop and design a structure around it. So again, if you haven't gotten it yet, this is the guide and we're gonna be referencing page number six, surfacepatterndesigners.com forward slash guide. And we're gonna be referencing number six if you want to work at the same time I am. We're gonna talk about the plan. So part number one is to simply acknowledge the dream. And so I want you to be thinking about this right now. You might have a really big dream or goal on your heart. It could be to be a fabric designer. It could be to be a wallpaper designer. It could be to quit your day job. It could be something grand, like, you know, um, <laughs> even bigger than that. It could be to be uh, featured by Oprah. It could be something really big, probably so big that you might feel vulnerable saying it out loud or sharing it with your friends and your family. But something happens when you acknowledge it and you say it out loud. There is accountability that is involved and there's like momentum that seems to just pick up around you when you acknowledge it and say it out loud. So I'm inviting you to put in the chat what your big dream is, what your big goal is and get used to acknowledging it and saying it out, out loud. If you are working with me on the worksheet, what I want you to do is at the top of page number six, I can show it to you. This is page number four, sorry. It might be number, might be number four, it might be number six. <laughs> at the top here, write down your big dream. Now, this should be something that's big enough that it's gonna take a while. It's gonna take a while. So we've got children's book illustrator build custom doll houses. Um, <laughs> I wanna design jigsaw puzzles. I wanna own my own successful design company to be a textile designer, to be a fabric designer, um, to, let's see, to become a sex successful designer, to illustrate for children to do fabrics that bring joy, um, to create residual income for retirement, um, to be a handbag designer, to be a children's book illustrator. You are in good company. <laughs> you are in good company. So write down your dream. For example, we're going to build this out with the example, I want to be a fabric designer. Part number two is to identify the long-term goals that it will take that you know that it will take for you to accomplish your big goal. So these are things that are like 12 to 18 months out. They are blurry. You don't know exactly what they look like. You don't know how you're gonna get there. And they may feel very overwhelming, but you're gonna put them on paper and set them aside. So for instance, if your goal is to become a fabric designer, you're gonna list three long-term goals that directly relate to achieving your big goal. So for example, that would be something like create a list of potential licensing partners. Number two, send your portfolio to 10 different companies. Number three, maybe exhibit at a licensing trade show. So they're big things, things that feel far away. Part number three is to identify the midterm goals. So these are things that are still a little bit fuzzy, but you do know that they're gonna have to be accomplished in order to meet that big goal that you have. These are probably six to 12 months out. So for example, you could write down, create three different pattern collections. We're gonna talk about collections in a little bit. You could write down, design a physical and a digital portfolio and create a website. Now, part number four is to identify the short-term goals. They are zero to six months out. So the things that you know that you're close to being able to get started with and things that you know you're going to start with. So for instance, this could be learn Adobe Illustrator, start building your audience, like set up your social media and start posting um, you know, your designs and what you're doing and decide on a business name. This is a big one, <laughs> decide on a business name early on. Part number five is acting on daily tasks. This is where the consistency comes in. This is where the actual productivity comes in. You are going to start working on something every day. And you do have, even if it's just five minutes, that counts. 
So for instance, you're here at the Surface Design Symposium, and so you've done your thing for today. So <laughs> you're done for the day, and tomorrow you need to do something else to work towards your big goal. For example, you can start by researching, researching the industry that you wanna move into. Ask lots of questions. Ask, and I, I put this on here, I know it comes with a little bit of explanation. So just start seeking, start being curious. Email some people. Maybe you're emailing people who you might never hear back from, but maybe you will hear back from them. One curious seek will just, like one question will lead to one answer, which will spark the next question and will get you the next answer. You don't need to know what questions you need to ask tomorrow. You just need to know what you need to find out today. And maybe you start taking a class or a course that will help you make momentum towards accomplishing your goal. So at this point, you're going to do one thing every day. And I use, so I use this trick to, if we call it a trick, to get my first licensing contract. I have continued to set incredible, maybe potentially unreachable goals one after another. And I keep doing this one thing a day in effort to, to reach them. And it keeps working over and over and over again. So my goal for you is if you miss one day, don't miss two. It takes consistency, consistently approaching what you're wanting to learn or develop in your, in your life. And you, so that's, that's the goal is if you miss one day, don't miss two. Okay, I do. Okay, so this is something else that you can grab if you want. Um, those were the big bullet points. Those were the big bullet points of what that journey looks like. But over the last 10 years, I have literally had a front row seat to thousands of success stories, successful students who have started just like I did with, with really no information and went on to live their best creative dream. And so because I've had a front seat, I see that so many people go through the same things. So what that led me to do is create something called the stages to becoming a flourishing designer or the stages of a flourishing designer. This is six stages and they are, it's a multiple page PDF as well. Again, it's free. There's a quiz that you can take that will help you identify where you're at on the uh, stages as well. But it breaks things down in a much more in-depth way than I just did. If you're working on something you want to be a surface pattern designer, go grab these stages, which will outline the entire roadmap with multiple steps that you need to accomplish for each stage. Okay. <laughs> so that's surfacepatterndesigners.com forward slash stages. Okay. Um, the two things that I feel really, um, I don't want to say trip people up, but they're sticking points. They feel big. They feel overwhelming. They feel confusing our style and collections. So I want to talk about style, signature style, and developing your signature style and collections. Um, okay, sorry, I have pages and pages of things that I want to share with you. So your signature style, if that term is new to you, is that special something that an artist has that makes their artwork recognizable even when their name isn't on it. Can you think of someone who has a strong signature style? If so, I want you to pop their name into the chat. Um, a surface pattern designer whose work you can recognize even if their name is not attached to it. Yeah, these are great examples. Um, and I would agree with, I would agree with all of them. So this is the goal, is to have a signature style. Because so many of us don't come out of the gates with a signature style, this is one of the things that is hard. It feels overwhelming, it feels scary, and many people just stop. It is easier to just stop than to work through developing the style. But what I want you to know is that as an artist, you have a unique opportunity to leave an entire impression on the world. And discovering what that exactly is, is such a beautiful process worth every ounce of your energy and every second of your time. Developing a signature style is what will 
hone your skills. It's what will set you apart from the rest. And you're not supposed to know what it is. There are very few people who just seem to be born with a signature style. And so any one of those people that you just posted in the chat, any one of those people, I want you to go over to their Instagram feed and start scrolling. Just start scrolling. You might be scrolling for days. So <laughs> just start scrolling and you'll see how their signature style developed. We all started with something that isn't quite where we have landed today. And we all, um, it, it just develops and it evolves over time. So I wanna talk about five practical tips that can help you move towards finding your own style. Are you ready? There's also, uh, this is also in the workbook, I think on page nine, if you want to follow along with me there. Number one is that I want you to truly create the beauty that you want to see come alive in the world. This is easier said than done because the internet and Instagram and Pinterest is at our fingertips. Oftentimes we create things similar to other things that we've seen. If you can close your eyes to that and create literally just what you want to see come alive in the world, it will help you hug your signature style more closely. There's two, um, the, the brain, <laughs> the brain remembers too well what it has seen. It makes it too hard to not hug something else that we've seen really closely. So if you take inspiration from other artists, you have to take inspiration from a multitude of them so that your original, your final artwork is original to you. Another thing that we talk about sometimes is creating before you consume. So sitting down to create something, if you sketch or paint or draw or illustrate or work on your repeating patterns to come to that fresh without having consumed any other inspiration before that for the day. Because um, number one, it will help you really stay close to your style. Number two, it's going to help you not feel deflated. It'll help you not have imposter syndrome. And the worst thing of all is when you have an idea and you're going to start working on it, and then you see someone else had almost the exact same idea. It's crushing. So just create before you consume anything. Create the beauty that you want to see coming up. Come in, I see my typo right there. A live entity world. <laughs> Number two is grow a deep love for yourself and where you are right now. I want to unpack that a little bit because there seems to be this pressure and this rush, this rush to arrive, this rush to have all of it buttoned up, your signature style, um, you know, settled and you're, and you're living your best life with license and contracts all over the place, right? It takes time. It just truly takes time to develop your signature style and put together work that feels like a direct reflection of your soul into collections and into a portfolio. And it honestly cannot be rushed. From my perspective, I really can almost tell when, um, when it has been rushed. I can almost always tell when it has been rushed. But the, the takeaway message that I want you to hear and know and believe is that there's not a closing window of opportunity. The, the, the market is not saturated. There are, do you know how many people are in this world? <laughs> There are so many people in this world and so many companies and so many licensing opportunities. I mean, I had a student once go into Target with a notebook and their mission was to write down every company or product that they saw with artwork on it. And they, they got hundreds and hundreds and had to leave before they finished. And that's just one store. Um, you can be designing for so many different things. You could be designing for products or fabric or wallpaper. There are so many different niches and, um, and I get to see so many stories that I, I get so sad and disheartened when people think that there's not room for them because I'm, I'm seeing all these incredible niches open up every single day. I've had students go on to open their own companies like, um, 
design their own diapers and launch their own diaper company and uh, like see a gap or a hole in the industry of what they want and decide to fill it themselves. So there's no closing of, uh, of there's not a closing window of opportunity. And, and what I want you to know is that the right opportunity will be waiting for you when you have arrived. You're not missing anything and it's vital to your success that you take the necessary time to develop your style and your drawing approach. Um, in fact, I would, I would say every one of those surface pattern designers who have a strong signature style that you put into the chat, I hear this from accomplished surface designers over and over and over again, that some of their favorite work was created in this phase. It's a quiet phase. No one really knows who you are, what you're doing. You're not pitching. You're not, you don't have a portfolio. You're just exploring your creativity and your approach to designing. And so many times our favorite work gets developed then. Do you know why? Because we're playing where there's no pressure. There's no deadlines. There's no um, got to show this on Instagram. There's no um, art directors giving you feedback or briefs. You are truly creating the beauty that you want to see come alive in the world. And it's fun. It's so much fun. So embrace this early time, cherish it, nourish it, and know that you will come to the other side when you're ready. Number three is chase your inspiration. And what I mean by this is that oftentimes we kind of wait for inspiration to strike. But one of my favorite parts of surface pattern design is that it takes me out into the world and puts me in front of the things that inspire me the most. So it's really important that you not just collect inspiration on the internet. Do I need to say that again? <laughs> It's you're, if you're just collecting information, if you're just collecting inspiration on the internet, you're missing it. You're missing the whole joyful part of surface design. It longs for you to come out into the world, go for a walk, visit museums, go, go get in front of the thing that inspires you the most. And you'll have a new leash on life. You'll, you'll see things differently, I promise you. I've made entire repeating patterns um, that got licensed from a leaf in a parking lot. I was just walking out of this pizza, this pizza restaurant in Flat Rock, North Carolina, and I looked down and it had been raining. And there was, um, is it called a, a whippoorwill? I'm not sure what it's, that's a bird, isn't it? I can't remember. It's the thing that spins. And it was just laying there like so beautifully. <laughs> and I'm like, grab my phone, take a picture of it and create an entire um, an entire pattern from it. Polybob? I don't know if that's what it is either. And so my point is that once you start seeing and you start looking with new eyes, you will see a whirly gig. <laughs> I'm laughing. I've never heard of a whirly gig, but I think it's probably a whirly gig. Um, you'll start seeing everything as potential inspiration. You can go on two different kinds of walks. You can go for a walk and you can go for a walk to gather inspiration. And all of a sudden, everything that you see becomes potential. And you don't have to be inspired by nature. You could be inspired by vintage things or antiques or old cars or birds or um, all kinds of different animals and travel and memorabilia. It can be anything, but I want you to go get out get out from behind the computer and go find your inspiration. This is the most fun part of the whole career. Number four is there's just no getting around this one. You have to create work, a lot of it, um, more than you probably wish. <laughs> you have to create so much work because here's the point, you have to, dis you have to explore. There are so many different ways to approach designing. Do you like to work with pencil or pen and paper or paintbrush? What kind of paper do you like? Do you like to scan in items that you find out in the world? 
Do you like to photograph things and then maybe trace some some elements from the photographs? Do you like to um, then after you decide that you have to decide if you want to use an iPad Pro and what brush or style do you like to use? What app are you going to use? Are you going to use Procreate or the Adobe Illustrator app or Fresco? Are you going to um, use a Wacom tablet and are you going to love the paintbrush tool or the blob brush tool? There's so much. Are you going to use a limited color? palette or lots of color palettes and you owe it to yourself to explore you owe it to yourself to have fun considering all of those different approaches and that's what builds your signature style that's what builds it because you'll find this technique that not a lot of people are using and you'll start weaving it into your work and you'll 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 make a huge body of work and you'll turn around and all of a sudden realize that there's a consistency. Maybe you didn't even see it before. For me, this took a little over a year and a hundred patterns. I, I took a little over a year and made a little over a hundred patterns. And it wasn't until then that I looked back and I started to see a consistency. And my favorite pieces are what ended up in my very first portfolio that got uh, licensed. And so, Yes, exactly, Vicki. You owe it to yourself to explore. I This one is really important as well. Surround yourself with support um, in this industry. Not only in this industry. When you have big goals, um, you're going to get some wild reactions. You're going to get some sideways looks because many people don't chase after big things. Um, and that's okay. We aren't all made that way but some of us are we're made hungry and um motivated and we're go-getters are you a go-getter if you're a go-getter type in go-getter <laughs> in the chat and so it's really important that you also surround yourself with other go-getters because nothing will squash your dreams and your productivity and your progress quicker than people around you not believing in you or thinking you're silly or telling you to go do something better. Nothing will squash it faster. So you may have those people in your life, but it is so incredibly important that you surround yourself with people who understand and support you. And there are, if you don't have that in your everyday life, like how many people have someone that, like how many people that you know even know what surface pattern design is, let alone want to talk about like vectors and the pinpoint tool in Illustrator, right? Like not a lot of us have people in our actual day-to-day -day lives that understand this industry and the language. And so if you don't have that in your day-to-day -day life, then know that there are places online and many, many communities that will just wrap their arms around you and be able to fully like support you and understand your big goals and help you get there. We want to normalize success in artists particularly. We want to normalize the success of artists and creatives. Okay. Let's talk about collections. So for sure, how am I on time? I'm pretty good. For sure, creating collections and working in collections is the number one thing that I've done in my career as a surface pattern designer that has rewarded me. It is um, something that has to be really um, curated and learned, and it will help you present your work in such a way that can be viewed and seen and understood and, and be able to tell a story. So I have, there are 10 parts to a great collection. I'm gonna go over five of them with you. And the other five are in the guide. Um, I'm gonna go over five of the 10. Number one is a story. So I am so passionate about telling a story through your artwork. This is one of the many ways that you can create impact as an artist. You can have a deeper meaning behind the artwork that you create. And honestly, one of the best examples of this is my latest fabric collection that I just got to announce yesterday. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Um, my last Instagram post explains the story behind this collection. And I think um, I'm just sending you there so that you can see 
how story and illustration can intertwine. Um, I don't want to take the time to go into it right like the whole story of that one but if you want to if you want to read into it you can head over there but illustrating and collections in particular will help you unfold an entire story so i love telling a story this is one way that i weave in my personal um, life my personal like things that i find important to me um i tell this i told the story of my grandparents in the last collection um it's it's just a really beautiful way to be able to make impact in the world. So number one is a story. Number two is original inspiration. We've already talked about this a bit, but I want to encourage you to source your own inspiration all, all the way as far as you possibly can. So take your own photographs, get out in the world and consume your own organic inspiration. Don't gather your inspiration online, like I've said before. Um, for me, I love to garden. It's one of my favorite things. It's how I play. And I plan my garden every year based on what I want to design. And so all of the flowers in the print that's on the side of my slideshow here um, are things that I grew. I grew them from seed. <laughs> like it is such a cool feeling to grow something from seed, see it grow, photograph it and design from it, and then see it come alive in the world on a product. It's just incredible. So take your inspiration just as far back as you possibly want, but at least start by getting in front of your own inspiration and um, taking your own photographs. Number three, a great collection usually has eight, 10, or 12 prints. Um, this is what's considered a collection. Anything less than eight prints is probably considered a mini collection. So uh, we used to do a lot of collections with 12 prints. The industry seems to look closer to eight to 10 prints right now. Um, and those, depending on the industry that you're working in, um, those the uh, one collection of eight prints is usually offered in two different colorways. There are always exceptions to that, but typically it's one collection, but each print is offered in two different colors. Number four are three different types of prints in each collection. So typically we have hero prints, coordinate prints, and blender prints. So hero, hero prints are like the showstoppers of the collection. They're the winners. They're the ones that tell the story most deeply. They're the ones that if you walked into a fabric store, you wouldn't be able to leave without. Coordinate prints are in direct support of the hero prints, but they're a little bit less detailed. They're, they they um, support the story, but they um, don't tell the whole story. And then blender prints are used to really give the eye a place to rest. So blender prints are actually the grid behind the slide is a great example. They're things like polka dots and stripes and um, checks and things like that. So those really work to blend the collection together and also break up any busyness and give the eye a place to rest. Number five is varying scale. So this is something that new newbies um, tend to struggle with quite a lot because there's scale is so flexible, especially if you're designing in Adobe Illustrator, you can endlessly scale things up, you can endlessly scale them down. And so refining your collection to where there's differing scales at the end of it is one of the uh, one of the ways to really refine your presentation. And so you'll have large scale, medium scale and small scale. Um, I hesitate to tell you, like, um, there, there are really no rules ever. <laughs> there are never any rules um, and rules are meant to be broken anyways. But many times hero prints will be large and blender prints will be small, but there are always exceptions to that rule as well. OK, so for six through ten, uh, head on over to the guide. There are five more tips in there, but to save us time, I went over the top five. Now I wanna talk about a five step process that I have developed just out of necessity. Um, it's how I design collections. So I think I've designed 15 collections over the last, um, well, since 2012. And I have just developed this, this process that works really, really well for me. So I'm gonna share it with you 
in hopes that it might help you as well. So there are five steps. Number one is brainstorming. I do this, I promise you, before every single collection. I need to get quiet. I need to get into a place where I maybe don't usually sit. I need to remove all technology and I need to sit down with my brain and a piece of paper. I call them big thinking sessions or brainstorming sessions. And I just write down all of these things. I want to flesh out the idea that I have for the collection, think about different um, prints that could go with it or how I could really tell the story. Number two is something I call the quick jot. This is 15 ideas for actual repeating patterns, and I put them all on one page. I draw with a pencil like two inch by two inch squares, and I just get out of my brain the ideas that I have for, for the different prints, knowing that I say 15 because I know some of them are not going to work out. Um, and I also know at this point, like I super trust the process, that there will be new ideas that come, and it's and that I can't even come up with right now. There'll be new ideas that come in the design process, but I want to get 15 ideas out of my brain and on paper so that I can move forward with clarity. So like for my last collection that just got announced yesterday, I quick jotted, super quick jot, like a beaver and a floral, this big floral, um, and then a uh, like a little um, hash mark blender. And I just quickly, da, 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 just to get my ideas on paper. Number three is 20 words. So I literally, sometimes I grab the thesaurus, sit down and write at least 20 words that helps support the theme, helps support the story, and really rounds out my ideas for the story. And so um, I will come back to this. There's nothing worse than getting into the process and feeling like you've lost your way or you can't remember what you were going to do or you need to go back to the drawing board. So doing these five steps really gives me a foundation that I can fall back to because there's always a messy middle. You, I'm going to say that again. There's always a messy middle. I don't care who you are or how professional you are with every collection, there will be a time where you don't know if it's going to work or not. And when you've got the foundation, these five things, you can fall back on it. And the more collections that you create, you see the messy middle and you're like, oh, there's the messy middle. I'm just going to keep working straight through it <laughs> because you finally learn to trust the process. You're going to trust the process and know that you come out on the other side. So number four is your story. During this five parts process, you're gonna literally write the story. You don't have to be an author or a writer. I'm saying three to five sentences. It's just a paragraph that just gets the story out of your heart and onto paper. Number five is photography. Just like we talked about inspiration. I want you to flood your camera or your phone with pictures of what you want to use as inspiration. You're going to pull colors from these photographs. You're going to draw from these photographs and you're going to feel so good about it at the end because your inspiration came all the way back from the very beginning with you. Okay, so before we wrap up, the overarching theme that I want you to leave with is consistency. I love this quote from my pastor, Craig Rochelle, successful people do consistently what normal people only do occasionally. Consistency is how big dreams and big goals and everything big gets accomplished. Consistency means long-term consistency, approaching your artwork day after day after day, year after year after year. If you keep showing up, there's only one way for you to go, and that's up. That's up, friend. If you keep showing up, there's only one thing that will happen. You get better and better, and you make more and more progress. There are no overnight successes. You go back and look at all of those successful signature style artists. They were None of them were successful overnight. There are years that go in to someone that seemingly seems like they were an overnight success. It takes dedication and you all have dedication. You all have the ability to break things down and make consistent progress. I love this quote by Vincent Van Gogh. Great things are done by a series of small things brought together. 
And I want to leave you <laughs> with this. There's room for you. There's truly room for you. The world needs your art. The world needs your perspective. The world needs the stories that you want to tell. The world needs your happiness. The world needs more joy. And when you make a living, when you make money doing something that you love, there's joy. There's joy in your own life. There's joy in your family. And there's joy with everyone who you meet. And so there's absolutely room for you. Someone told me this many, many years ago, and it made a huge impact for me. And it, I hope that it makes a huge impact for you. That is it. And we have 11 minutes for questions. Um, Bonnie, thank you so much. And I, I've been writing down a few questions <laughs> as we've gone. So I'm sure there'll be more coming in, but here are a few. Um, the first one is, um, I feel like I'm finally doing something different from others, but I'm not sure if it's marketable. So what do you do in that situation? Well, this is so hard without seeing it, but I feel like there is a market for everything. You just have to find your market. There are markets for haunted houses and there's markets for cats and there's markets for like black and white artwork and there's markets for all kinds of different things. It may not be what you know of right now, but you can rest assured that it exists and you just need to find it. You need to find your people. There are more people like you. And honestly, the um, more that you niche down, the easier it's gonna be to even find your people. So I would say um, you just have to do some research, find the companies where your artwork would make a good match or a good direction for them to go in and start reaching out. Okay, great. Um, another question was, how do you go through the storytelling process when your style is abstract? Well, I still think abstract art tells a story. Um, it doesn't have to be an obvious story, right? But like, what you're doing is putting words to your why. Um, I often have abstract artists also ask me about that hero blender coordinate print setup because all of their art is abstract and maybe very geometric. And so there is a version for everyone of what a hero print would look like. It doesn't have to be super intricate or detailed. It doesn't have to be that way. It just has to be what really um, grounds the collection. And the same thing with your story. The story, you can be left field. It can be something that isn't obvious. Many of my stories are not something obvious. In fact, even my strongest story, which is the one that just released, if you saw my collection, you would have no idea what the story was. You have to read the story along with the collection to get it, to know that it goes together. So I just think that this is an incredible way to bring meaning to your work and also really resonate with the person who's viewing it. So if you can tell a story with your collection that's gonna be seen by an art director, then it's gonna have more meaning with it and potentially be able to create a bigger impact as well. Thank you so much. Um, one question came in was, do surface pattern designers always hand draw their work? No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. I love this question because oftentimes people feel like they can't draw. And like I said, I didn't feel like I was an artist when I started. Um, there are so many surface pattern designers who are famous for like scribbles and doodles, literally like scribbles. And so first of all, I bet that you can draw better than you think. If you can do bobbles and doodads and whirly gigs, then you can totally create using pen and pencil. You can also create using paintbrush and you don't have to be able like these things right here are like little blobs that I made into a pattern. You can also um, trace from photographs if they're your own. And you can also scan in items from um, nature. So I have a new class coming out on Skillshare that was, um, it was uh, broadcasted live on Earth Day, so it's not released yet, but I think it's coming out in the next week or two. And we, what we did was create an entire pattern from nothing but scanned in things. And so, for instance, if I, have, if I show you this um, planner, um, these were hand-drawn and these were hand-drawn, but the fern, 
those ferns are scanned in. You can actually see it. I have it framed right here. Sorry, my camera is going in and out. So this framed fern I picked alongside the road. I scanned it in and it is right there in my work. And so you can absolutely do things like that and it makes it so much fun. Um, okay, another question was, should you be showing your work while you're finding your style, like in those early stages or not? I think so, because you want to, I, I think you'll know if you are proud of a piece of work, then show it. Um, end of story. If you're proud of it, then show it. If you're not proud of it, then wait until you feel really proud of something that you've designed. But when in doubt, always show. And if you need like a big boost of energy, I recommend Show Your Work by Austin Cleon. This book is called Show Your Work by Austin Cleon. It's amazing and it'll just breathe new life into the mindset based around that. But I cannot tell you how many people I know who never even got to the portfolio stage. They never even made a portfolio and they never pitched, but because they were showing their work, maybe on Instagram, they got picked up by their biggest and best licensing partners. So always show your work um, and know that, like, like I said, if you start scrolling, we all have work. Um, there's this quote that says, if you are not embarrassed about what you did a year ago, you haven't grown enough. And that's so true. I I just cringe when I look at what I shared a year ago. So go ahead and share it, knowing that in a year, you're probably going to be cringing, but we all have that. That's all part of our development. Okay, great question. Um, and um, one question was from someone who's just recently graduated from college, and she's interested in doing service pattern design, but is just wondering, like, how long does it take until this is really kind of like a full-time job, a full-time income, I guess? Yeah. So if you, it depends on how much time you have, but I would give yourself a year if you don't have an art practice at all. Like if you don't know Adobe Illustrator, you don't have an art practice and you want to get to where you're actually pitching and maybe um, signing contracts, give yourself a year. Learning Adobe Illustrator is what most of us use. Um, Many people are also using Photoshop and um, some iPad Pro, but we really all like to finish our work in Adobe. Um, if you have to learn that, just give yourself time. It just takes time to get comfortable with the program and learn it from A to Z um, and then explore all of your different artwork approaches and then put together a body of work that you're really proud of. It could take a year, it could take two years. Um, it's really important to just go, like, give yourself that time and um, you'll thank yourself for it. Um, so this person says, um, so many designers do florals and you do them so beautifully. And she's wondering if it's okay to use your imagination and kind of be quirky and do something completely different. Or should your style really be something that people are already familiar with? Well, no, I would say go quirky. <laughs> I would, but this is me. I, not everyone agrees with me. So I'm going to tell you my perspective. You do what resonates with you better. Some people will advise that you have certain things in your portfolio, um, almost like working from a brief. I personally want to create, like I said, literally the beauty that I want to see come alive in the world. And I want to create from that place of freedom. I want to create from that place of exploration. I mean, that's true creativity is creating whatever I want and then see who else is interested in it. And that's worked well for me. And it's worked well for many, many, many of my students. And so I would say, don't ever try to gauge what is needed and then work backwards. Because, I mean, maybe not, don't ever, I have to be careful with what I say. Maybe that works for some people, but I, I think that um, it could really stifle your signature style. So I say, go quirky, like do what you want to do, do what you love to do. That's what makes this so fun. Um, and I, I know this is a big question, but um, do you need to, you know, officially copyright all your designs before you're ready to reach out to, you know, an art director at a company or something like that? 
Okay, so I have a little disclaimer. Every time I get to talk about copyright stuff, I have to say, I'm not a lawyer and I will just tell you my understanding of the laws. Please go talk to a lawyer if you have actual real questions that you want real answers to. But <laughs> when we talk about copyright, um, a lot of it has to do with risk tolerance. Are you, um, so when you create a piece of art, you do own the copyright. Like you don't have to copyright it with the copyright.gov to own the copyright. You can copyright it, Bonnie Christine. I can do a little doodle right now. I don't have to do that. And I will own the copyright. But if you want to be able to take legal action, say someone copies it, then you do need to have the official copyright. So I know many professional, successful surface pattern designers who don't copyright their work. Um, I think it depends on your, your question of like, what if someone copies it? Then do you want to be able to take legal action or are you going to just move on? Um, personally, I copyright my work before it's published. So I wait until I know it's finalized. So I create it, we get it licensed, it's finalized, and then I copyright it so that once it gets in, in wide distribution, then I do have that protected protection and coverage. Um, but again, I know people who don't. I also know people who copyright right away. Um, so I think the question there is, if you don't copyright your work and someone were to steal it, you really would either not be able to do anything about it or kind of be in a he, shit, he said, she said uh, situation like who created it first. So copywriting your own work is a great way to put a, a, a date, a stamp date on it so that that's never put into question. So it's something that I recommend for sure, but everyone has their own different risk tolerance around, surrounding copyright. Um, that's awesome. And Bonnie, that was our last our last question that we have time for, but do you have any parting words or ways to follow up with you for attendees today oh. who want to keep going? Yeah, thank you so much. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed connecting with all of you today. You're incredible. I truly believe we get to be in one of the most beautiful, creative, inspiring, and supportive communities in the whole world. I am Bonnie Christine at all the places, bonniechristine.com, Bonnie Christine on Instagram. Um, I would love to connect with you in any of those places. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. We so appreciate you. Thank you, Bonnie. Bye. Bye, everybody.